Pushkar. It is now 15 years since the Red Fort, a defining monument of Delhi, as indeed of the subcontinent, was listed as a World Heritage Site. To get a sense of what this means in terms of the life of the fort, it may be worthwhile to recall here that practically the entire Red Fort complex and its supporting city of Shah Janabad were constructed over a period of 10 years from 1639 to 1648 CE. The inclusion of the Red Fort complex in the UNESCO World Heritage List in 2007, about 360 years after its establishment, does not imply that it was only then that the fort came to embody universal values that the entire world should treasure. It is merely a larger recognition and ratification of its unique attributes. But what has this presumably larger recognition meant for the fort and its city? And have its unique attributes been conserved post this recognition or compromised? What are the lessons from our heritage as embodied in the Red Fort that we can learn from with respect to our climate? I'm going to briefly speak about this within the theme of climate resilience and historic urban landscapes. As we know, heritage and climate is the theme of this year's International Day for Monuments and Sites or World Heritage Day. Since we have limited time and since a picture is said to be worth a thousand words, I'm going to take recourse to visual images to communicate this as simply and as quickly as I can through a methodology of comparative analysis. I hope this will help us to perceive how the Red Fort responded to its ecology and geography to shape the climate of its time for the better, as also what we ought to do today to conserve this fundamental attribute of the fort, which is absolutely imperative in the context of the extreme climate change that we are living in. There are many aspects of the fort that clarify how intelligently it responded to its immediate and larger context, but I'm going to concentrate on two main aspects, temperature control and use of water. All of us to some extent grapple with these two facets of climate change, and these are only going to become more acute if we continue in the way we presently live and build. To understand what heritage in the form of the Red Fort can demonstrate to us about climate, let me begin with some images which show us its design interface with the city and its surroundings. This is a detail of the 1840s map of Shah Jahanabad. Please bear in mind that this map dates from about 200 years after the fort's establishment, and there have been some changes in its appearance and function. The introduction of an indirect entrance on the western and southern faces of the fort, that is towards the Chani Chok and towards the Fez Bazaar, respectively, is one of the more visible and obvious changes. We can also see how the open area in front of the western face of the fort has been appropriated for the Lal Diki, the tank constructed on the orders of Lord Ellenborough in 1846. On comparing the eastern and northeastern face of the fort, that is towards the Yamuna, with the western and southern faces, that is towards the city, we further observe that first, the fort walls are surrounded by a moat on all sides, except the eastern and the northeast. Here, the fort walls do not have a continuous water border in the form of the moat, but are separated by a strip of sandy bank from the Yamuna River. On the other sides, that is those except the eastern and the northeastern face, there are bogs beyond the moat. These bogs, right from the earliest depictions and records of the fort, as for instance, in this simplified plan of the fort, consist of flowering and fruiting shrubs, wines, and trees. 
They create a verdant and shaded space all around the port, which is designed to have visual, functional, and climatic benefits. So, Francoise Bernier, who lived in Shah Jahanabad during the last years of Shah Jahan's reign and the first few years of Aurangzeb's reign, writes, and I quote, adjoining the ditch is a large garden filled at all times with flowers and green shrubs, which contrasted with the stupendous red walls produces a beautiful effect. However, it is important to note that these baths do not merely provide a beautiful setting for the port, but also reduce the heat intake in its immediate surroundings. Their provision helps to recharge rather than reduce the water table in the vicinity of the intensively populated port and city. And lastly, and equally importantly, these are designed to be accessible to the people of the city as shaded recreational spaces to meet, sit, stroll, exchange views and strengthen social ties right next to the emperor's presence in the port beyond its protective moat. This collective social function of the urban landscape continues even when the construction of new roads and structures around the fort boundary in later years reduces the extent of these baths. For instance, on 11th May 1857, when the Indian soldiers entered the city, after riding in from Meerut, a crowd of about 500 people is recorded to have collected in the Anguri Bar in front of the fort. Let us now turn to the eastern and northeastern faces of the fort with the Yamuna flowing along these faces. These are sited and aligned to benefit from the temperature mitigating effect of the proximity of the river water and its cool river breezes. Here there are no trees planted around the fort walls since there is no need for them. Neither is there a moat. The river during the monsoons comes close to the fort, sometimes lapping its very walls. There is, as part of a deliberate design, no provision or plan for growing trees or shrubs here. And the foundations of the fort are also presumably planned differently to cater to the occasional seasonal over flooding of the river banks. Even during the 19th and early 20th centuries, when changes are made in its surroundings and there is a reduction in its upkeep and some trees are allowed to grow on the eastern bank, we find most depictions of the port indicate that a certain minimum distance is maintained between any plantation and the fort walls here. It is important to note that this bank, which affords the emperor and his family a pleasant microclimate and beautiful views is also open to the people of Shah Jahanabad and Delhi. Many of the inhabitants of the city come here every morning to pay their respects to the Mughal emperor who sits at the balcony of the Musamman Burj for the daily Darshan ceremony. At other times, the riverbank becomes a site for celebration and public recreation in a continuation of the provision of the series of carts on the Yamuna River front with public gardens just within and around the city walls. The riverbanks are thus open to view and open to use, as are the baths around the fort. These design responses at the interface of the fort and Shah Janabad and the river allow the emperor and the entire city to benefit from the geography and ecology of the region in ways that rejuvenate the earth and sky and literally flow with the water. Let us now enter the fort. The water and temperature management inside the fort follows a similar design logic. If we study the plan of the fort, which records its form just before its large scale destruction in 1857 and its aftermath, we see first that there are various wells. Some of these, such as the Bauli in the northeastern part, northwestern part of the port, which is incorporated into the plan of a formal bag, predates the construction of the port. These are not demolished or turned into rubbish heaps, but intelligently co-opted 
in to the layout of the fort. As we all know, an important aspect of mitigating climate change is how to reuse more and demolish less. And we see how this philosophy of conservation and considerate and frugal use of resources determines the planning and functioning of the palace fortress of arguably the richest ruler in the world at that time. This is evident not just in the reuse of built structures and baudis, but also in the way that water is used in and around the fort. So both the moat around the fort, as well as the channels and fountains inside the fort are designed to have multiple uses and feed back into the Yamuna. The moat's flowing water is stocked with fish, the water channels and fountains inside the fort not only pool its forecourts, pavilions and streets, they also irrigate the bags as they flow west to east through the Hayat Baksh and Metab Bagh, or north to south through the Nahari Bahisht to join back in the Yamuna whose waters flow further south. What is remarkable is that these water features achieve all this without much recourse to mechanical means. Instead, they utilize the site topology guided by an overall planning scheme that introduces imperceptible slopes in the ground level. The planning of the fort incorporates and locates walls, aqueducts, fountains, and garden beds to respond to level differences such that the flow of gravity ensures proper and sustained percolation and drainage of water. Thus, not only is the embodied energy of the fort buildings and gardens the minimum, but also the running costs do not expend extra energy. It is revealing to read Gordon Sanderson's remarks in the ASI annual report of 1911-12 in this context, where he mentions that for the celebrations at the fort on the occasion of the coronation that of 1911, as part of the conservation work undertaken here, pumps had to be run continuously for two weeks to operate the fountains and fill the water tanks. Having seen how the fort's original design responded to geography, topology, and resources, let us now contrast this with what we have done in the past 15 years, a period of time let me underline again which is one and a half times more than the time that it took to plan and build the fort. This is an image of the eastern face of the fort today, its erstwhile imperial face. Instead of the open bank, well-maintained and kept accessible to the people of Shah Janabad, who frequented it in the times of the Mughals, we now have a municipal garden with non-native trees transplanted here and lawns, which require far more water than the region of Delhi can afford. Fenced around with high energy embodied metal railings that are installed to keep people out and ill-maintained so that stagnant water seeps up right next to the eastern face of the fort walls in to Shah Jahan's own private imperial entrance. This is where he is recorded to have entered the fort for the first time on the occasion of its inaugural celebrations. Ironically, this part of the fort, where the emperor's own mehels and baths were once screened by beautiful marble jalis and inlaid walls, is now the most unkempt and worst maintained face. Sadly, it is reminiscent of the ruinous and decimated state of the fort at the time of 1857 and its aftermath. And what of the western face of the fort, its most recognized and reproduced image that we see every 15th August? Here we see a different kind of development today, different from the east face, as well as from its original form. Instead of orchards, vines and trees, there are vast swathes of tarred roads and lawns that either radiate heat or require vast amounts of water to maintain in a city where many areas, if they're lucky, get portable water supply for a few hours each day. But many people have to stand in line for hours for one bucket of water. These lawns are also fenced with high metal railings to keep people out. Occasionally, when there are cultural extravaganzas and festivals, high-profile televised and advertised activities are organized here. 
These further guzzle water and energy and generate immense amounts of waste, akin to the colonial practice of using the port as a stage set while depleting and reducing its resources as in the Coronation Garden Party and its massive waste water. So finally, what should we be doing in our conservation and development efforts of the port such that they respond intelligently and responsibly to the realities and challenges today? Some simple measures come to my mind, which I'd like to share briefly. First, we should realize that the river has moved away. Instead of trying to recreate water tanks and fountains on the river base and making it superficially green, by putting lawns and exotic trees and plants which require quantities of water that we cannot afford to spend. It is instead advisable to make it green in the real sense of the word by making bags of low fruit bearing native trees at a safe distance from the port walls so that they do not damage and weaken the port's foundations. Such bags will not just be able to sustain themselves without requiring intensive watering but also in the long run will help to lower temperatures, recharge groundwater, provide a habitat that fosters biodiversity and a recreational open space for the residents of Shah Jahanabad and the citizens of Delhi without endangering the port or the city. On the sides where there is no moat protecting the port walls, that is the eastern face, measures such as providing carefully thought of protective plinths around the base of the port walls will help to ensure reduced water penetration and decay of the boundary walls of the fort. Rather than mechanical, electrical, or other such means, the natural slopes of the area can be utilized to channelize and utilize rainwater and incorporate it as both decorative and irrigative feature. Basic common sense principles must be followed, such as ensuring that the landscape interventions do not cause water collection, but instead aid water drainage and recharge. In other words, we must learn from the holistic planning principles of the port and reduce dependence on external means and instead depend on an exhaustive knowledge of the site to devise the best and most sustainable way to cater to the needs of its users as well as of the earth. Otherwise, it may well be that the embodied wisdom of the most magnificent palace in the East will dwindle into an unrecognizable caricature of itself that reverses its very planning principles or worse compromises its very existence 